So I just uh, finished watching uh, the three and a half hour debate that Robertson Jenis had with um, Dan Chapa. And I don't think I've ever um, watched a debate with Dan Chapa. Um, I've watched um, on several occasions um, shows that he's done with Turretin Fan. And so um, I, I, from what I have watched and seen, uh, I have enjoyed his contributions to the conversation with um, Turton Fan. Um, I believe they're both Calvinists or from the Calvinist tradition, um, but I don't think they agree with each other on some things, right? I don't know what their sort of histories or denominational backgrounds are, so I don't know why they would disagree on certain things. Um, if they're Calvinists, I would imagine they follow. Calvin's teachings on, on certain things. Maybe he left some things un, unresolved. But uh, in any case, this debate... Um, now, I've watched, I believe, most of uh, Robertson Genesis debates prior to, um, you know, the last few years. So he's been doing uh, debates uh, here and there in the last maybe five or six years. Uh, and they're online somewhere. And he doesn't tell me anymore as much as he used to when he's he does these debates. So I'll just, you know, it'll, it'll just pop up on my feed that he did this random debate with this person or geocentrism or whatever. Uh, and I didn't even know about it. So um, I'm talking about the early debates, mostly with um, James White. Um, and, you know, James White won't debate him any longer because he doesn't. He says uh, it's because, um, well, I don't know if he says this explicitly, but it, the, 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 the sense that's given is that, well, I think he has said this, like Robertson Genesis is no longer in the main stream or hasn't been in the mainstream, uh, you know, since the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, and yet he'd still debated <laughs> uh, him in 2010 for three debates. So um, I don't know if that's really accurate because he certainly wasn't mainstream in 2010 any longer. Um, so they, they never debated Sola Scriptura. That's one of the topics they haven't debated yet. And But they have had two, that I'm aware of, two uh, mass debates or Eucharist debates. The first one was uh, pretty early on, and it was one of the great debates um, that Chris Arnzen um organized and um you know we have that or that's online you could watch that um and i think it was on Lo in long island and then they had a second eucharist debate i think it was at the university of utah or something like that it was it was certainly a, at the at the same location that james white had a debate uh with jerry maddox and he also had a debate with mormons so i think it was it's it's like a mormon university or something but in any case, I, I, I like the second debate better. And a lot of what Robert used um, in his opening statements and his arguments in this debate with Dan Chapa um, harkens back to that James White debate, especially focused in on Thomas Aquinas and substance and accidents, distinctions from Aristotelian metaphysics. Now, um, I, I have in my own conversations echoed the um, view uh, that uh, that St. Genis has uh, or mentioned in that James White debate uh, that sort of the popular um, uh, explication of, of the Eucharistic doctrine or teaching uh, is typically explained through the categories uh, that Thomas Aquinas um, uh, proposed uh, relating to substance and accidents. And, and in conversation, I would still use substance and accidents. But this is the first time, I think, because of course that was, you know, that was 2006, I believe. So we're, we're close to almost 20 years since that James White debate. And this is the first time I've heard Bob um, Robertson Genis uh, explain the reasons why he doesn't use to mystic, uh, you know, metaphysics to explain transubstantiation. Now, if I'm going to be honest, though, I, I was a little, uh, I, I would hope 
uh, uh, Bob uh, Sojanis could explain further his position about the substance because I, I feel like what I heard or I should say I think what I heard kind of went um, it wasn't clear let me just say it wasn't clear because he claims that his position or what he says is that he doesn't believe in substance that the only thing in anything that's real that has substance is God so I think I understand what he's saying when he's saying that that we can only speak about substance when we're talking about God but the whole idea of change in bread so if bread doesn't have substance but the flesh of Jesus who's God does have substance because he is God because what so one the only thing that ha okay I, I'm not trained in philosophy so I'm just like I'll call these premises one G, uh, uh, God is the only thing that has substance nothing else has substance two bread is not God so therefore it has no substance three after the Eucharistic miracle what was not substance before bread becomes or changes into the flesh of Jesus who is God and does have substance right and so if St. Genesis rejects the concept of transubstantiation maybe he doesn't reject maybe he wouldn't say he rejects the terminology but it just seems incomprehensible to me that you could hold the term transubstantiation as true but the word there is tra trans change substantiation this tra change of substance so there is no change of substance if it, if something is is not substance and then it becomes substance then the substance isn't changing like it's like reality is changing so i i want him to maybe uh, you know flesh that out a little bit for us because I, I i'm confused how there is no substance and yet transubstantiation now i get his approach to his apologetics on the eucharist i, I really think I've, I've watched a lot of debates uh on the eucharist and the mass and all this other stuff from other debaters i you know and i am biased because <laughs> i've worked with bob uh, for you know 15 16 years uh, but I, I still do think he is the best uh, debater on certain subjects maybe he's not the best debater on on certain other subjects that I, I have been impressed with other more more uh, current uh, apologists uh, even though their approaches aren't uh, you know I call it the footsies approach to apologetics which is like very friendly and very you know whatever I, I really think this debate was the first time in a while that I felt like Bob was in his element as he used to be in the early days if not more so I think he's turned it up I was getting anxiety let me just say uh, you know poor Dad <laughs> Chapa was uh, was uh, you know in, in my mind and, I, and I'm not you know I'm, I'm not using this term uh, just kind of loosely but I almost feel like Bob was a little bit um, too too, uh, too much of a bully, it, it seems. But I think he was getting to the point. I think he was getting a little frustrated. <coughs> he was trying to avoid the dancing around certain issues. Now, um, now he used to do this with, with James White, poor James White, in some of the debates. Uh, he got frustrated as well. But um, I, I think... Um, you know, I, 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 w I would advise, you know, you know bob to just kind of be a little just a tad bit friendlier um <laughs> and I, I get why he's you know it's limited time i really think it's it's mostly the pressure of that you know if you double the time of this debate which would be endless uh maybe you, you wouldn't get so frustrated but you really have to get to the point to the meat of the issues here and um so i'll just say that i think the debate was was excellent uh, you know, Bob was back in his element as it was. I think there was, uh, I'll be honest about this, he had a few salvation debates 
and uh, it was with folks that were like I guess they're it's whatever free grace is I don't know I don't know much about that tradition <clears throat> but I don't think he fully understood where some of those debaters were coming from because his background is like he said Baptist he said Presbyterian Calvinist types Church of Christ very th those groups so I don't know if he did a little bit of pre-study on who these folks were that are free grace uh, because um, I think there, there was assumptions in some of those debates that he made and they were like wait we don't, we don't believe that I don't teach that and he's like wait you're Protestant or something like that I think it was something along, along those lines where it was he was arguing against sort of Calvinistic ish Protestantism when they don't hold some of those um, presuppositions so anyway, I do think this debate was good, was really good. I think you should watch it if you have time. I watched it at about 1.75 speed. So that three and a half hours ended up being probably like two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. Uh, I had to pause. And, and there were so many. Uh, I, I hate how YouTube now has all, all these ads. So every three or four minutes I have to listen to <laughs> ads to you know subscribe to ascension press whatever it is that they're selling and uh it was kind of annoying but um i think yeah so that, that that's my major feedback the substance and accident stuff that that was new to me and and i and i really enjoyed bob's um explanation for that um dan i think so so my view my understanding here or, or my assessment of Dan's position is I really think he's hung up on the distinction between intervention or intercession and sacrifice or propitiation right so Bob kept trying to hammer it now maybe those distinctions are valid but in my mind there's no there's no contradiction here the mass okay if we can agree, Dan, that the Mass is the once-for-all propitiatory sacrifice that happened one time in time um, on the cross, and Jesus paid, or that's, I'll just say paid the price. <laughs> he paid the price, not in a forensic way, but whatever that price is, the price of, of uh of appeasing the wrath of God on the cross. And now the pathway to the Father has been reopened. There is now possible reconciliation and communication. Uh, and you listen to our prayers because of the sacrifice of, of Jesus on the cross. So if you agree that that sacrifice is efficacious, it is propitiatory, it satisfies the, the wrath of God, appeases the wrath of God, and it is, um, what's the other word? So it's not just propitiatory, it is also um, propitiation and expiation. It, it cleanses us, it, it uh, regenerates us. It, it does have an internal change to our spiritual nature in terms of the infusion of grace. Now, you wouldn't use the term infusion, I don't think, because it's, it's more of a covering, I think. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I, I, I'm making that assumption. I'm thinking that's not just Luther's idea. I think it's also a Calvinist idea that it's there, there isn't really a change in the man, that it is a forensic, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a credit to my account on my behalf from the bank account of Jesus, I guess you could say. So um, if, you're say, if you agree that that is... Um, the cause of justification it's the basis of justification what the catholic is saying is that the mass is the same sacrifice so if we, we agree that that's that's the cause of justification then the mass is merely or simply the continuation of that same once for all sacrifice that once is still going on it's not that Jesus is still on the cross. That's done in time. But I think what St. Genesis, the insight that St. Genesis brings to, to the fore here is he rejects the idea of 
the eternal now, which is a popular apology, you know, basis for the apologetics that I am aware of from the other apologists to say that that sacrifice in time is extended or is is sort of pulled out of time and applied in time throughout eternity because Jesus exists out of, outside of time. Now, Genesis rejects that concept of eternal now, uh, that, that the other realm, the heavenly reality exists outside of uh, this, outside of time. I, I don't, I, I don't know, but I, I trust his assessment and people can debate him on this, whether that concept of outside of time is dogmatic. I, I trust that, that uh, I, you know, I, I accept his explanation for that, that we don't necessarily have to believe that God exists outside of time. So then his explanation is that Jesus is in heaven, um, continuing to offer that sacrifice in the Holy of Holies in heaven, uh, so to speak, right? Uh, on the, on the, um, and, and, and making intercession continuously, offering sacrifices. And even James White agreed with this. And, and it was in his book that, G, uh, that um, Sojanus quoted from in that debate. And I don't know if James White has changed his position since then because it was exposed that he wrote this in the book that Jesus continues to offer the sacrifices. The point that Sojanus made is um, James White's theology, at least in that book, was very Catholic. That the sacrifice is continuously being offered in heaven by Jesus to the Father to continuously appease the wrath of the Father um, so that he doesn't destroy us for our sins. Um, and so you don't need to be outside of time because it's happening now in heaven, Jesus in heaven offering those sacrifices. And, and the point about sacrifices, right? So, so, in the, so you could talk about the once for all, one sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but in a certain different sense, there are other sacrifices being made. I mean, just in the same way you could make a sacrifice um, as a part of your sanctification, I think the Protestant would have no problem with the concept of, of uh, sanctification, doing certain kind of good works as a form of sacrifice, not sacrifice for the sake of justification from a Protestant perspective, but a sacrifice in a human sense that you're actually, you're doing something, you're offering something up for the sake of uh, mortifying the body, let's say, or becoming holier uh, in terms of, um, taming the flesh, if you will. Um, so in, in, in a sense, there are other sacrifices.